This is God's Game of Thrones. Now we're back on Elijah. My favorite character. 2 Kings 2.1 And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now look at this whirlwind. This whirlwind seems to be used for some type of transportation back and forth for the Lord. Remember that this is God's Game of Thrones, so he's able to take out or insert anyone in and out of the picture, in and out of the game, as he pleases. So the whirlwind in the clouds seem to be some type of teleportation device that he uses. In Job 38, 1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. So the whirlwind seems to be a way the Lord could even communicate with them, talk through it. The second coming of the Lord, when the Lord uh, leaves the third heaven with us and comes to the earth, is connected with a whirlwind. In Isaiah 66, 15, it says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So the Lord transported Elijah from earth to the third heaven with this whirlwind. And Elijah seems to have a come-and-go ministry. He is an Old Testament exception to the rule that saints in the Old Testament go to the heart of the earth at death. And the reason I believe they go to the heart of the earth at death is because in Luke 16 you got Abraham and Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man sees Father Abraham. But Elijah sends a letter to Jehoram after he's taken up by the whirlwinds. And this happens in Second Chronicles 21.12. So this is what makes me believe he's got a come-and-go ministry. He also comes back down in Matthew 17.3 on the mountain with the Lord and with Moses. And I believe he is also one of the two witnesses that show up in Revelation 11 during the tribulation. I guess he's just such a good preacher that the Lord sends him back down for a quick revival every now and then. But you have those who want to use Elijah to prove that old that the Old Testament saints all went to the third heaven at death. And I believe Elijah and Enoch and Moses are exceptions to the rule. I don't believe that they went to the heart of the earth like all the other ones. On the other hand, you have those who don't believe that Elijah and Enoch went to the third heaven at all. But I believe they did. But they say, you know, nobody went to the third heaven in the Old Testament. Well, for the most part, they didn't, but there's exceptions. It even says that the two anointed ones, which would be Moses and Elijah, were standing before the Lord. And this was even in the Old Testament. So both of those guys were up there with the Lord before Jesus Christ died, was buried, and resurrected. In Zechariah 4.14, it's talking about the two witnesses from Revelation chapter 11. And it says, Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So compare Zechariah 4.14 with Revelation 11. Compare Zechariah 4 and read Revelation 11. You'll see the two anointed ones are the two witnesses of Revelation 11. The two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. So they were already standing by the Lord. Standing before the Lord of the whole earth back there in Zechariah. So they were already in the third heaven. Enoch was already in the third heaven. He had been translated. In 2 Kings 2.2, 2, it says, And Elijah said unto Elijah, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. So Elijah keeps telling Elisha to stay out while, to, you know, stay back while he goes on to Bethel. And Elijah won't do it. He's staying by Elijah's side and learning all that he can while he can. So it says, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. 
So the sons of the prophets don't seem to be doing any real work. They seem to be only concerned with what everyone else is doing and every, what everyone else has going on. They're working not at all, but are busy buddies. They don't really uh, do anything themselves. Uh, for the Lord, they just want to go around and kind of insert their opinion and try to correct everybody. Obviously, Elisha knew that Elijah was ready for liftoff. I mean, he's his protege. He's been walking and talking with him. But it is something that the sons of the prophets knew the day of Elijah's rapture. And I've heard the idea thrown back and forth that wouldn't it be something if that on the day of the rapture, the Lord spoke to every saint on the planet and said, it's today. Can you imagine the madness? I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, but it's fun to think about. See, the Bible is not just something I do for a job. Obviously, I don't make money off of it, but it's it's something I do as a hobby. It's something I do for fun and entertainment. And when, you, when the Bible is your hobby and you do it for fun and entertainment as well, then you start thinking outside the box you start thinking about more stuff than than just what most people think about when you read and that's one of the things you think about you know what if the lord did do that but you have thousands of people claiming the rapture is next week next month next year and so on and so forth and then when the rapture doesn't come on that day you know they make up some reason why it didn't happen i just don't get into all that nonsense that's nonsense Every video I post on here, there's a guy that says, I believe the rapture is going to be next week. I don't even respond to it because um, I don't know when it's going to be. No, nobody does. If I did hear a voice telling me the rapture was today, I'm not sure if I would even believe it. I mean, I just can't operate outside of this book. The first thing that's going to come to my mind if I heard that was, you know, remember, you got to go by the book. I just can't operate outside of what the Bible says. It, does, it, just, it doesn't tell me the date of the rapture, so I'm just going to live for the Lord until he comes. I'm not saying somebody couldn't possibly find the date of the rapture within the Bible. I just don't think that they will. I think there's a whole lot in here that God's got in here that people's never going to find until we get a glorified body. But it says in verse 4, And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. So Elijah, Elisha, isn't going to stay back. He's he's going with Elijah to Jer into Jericho, whether he likes it or not. Once again, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elijah's like, Do you all think I don't know this? Elijah is my teacher. I mean, I'm his, I'm his prodigy. His, and if he's about to get beamed up, don't you think I would know about it? And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee, hear, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they two went on. So Elijah wants Elijah to stay back while he goes to Jordan. Elijah's like, Nope, I'm coming with you. Elijah probably had a wide margin Bible filled with notes he got from sitting under Elijah preaching and had a tape for every message he preached in Bethel, Jordan, and Jericho, everywhere else. He was soaking it all up. And it says, And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. So these sons of the prophets aren't doing Jack Diddley squat. Their idea of being busy for the Lord is going around to see what people are doing who are busy for the Lord, and then probably pointing out the things that they're doing wrong. 2 Kings 2, 8, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. What a great verse. This is just as big of a miracle as Moses parting the Red Sea. 
The Lord did just as big of a miracle here as he did then. And Elijah just, he didn't even have as many people to see it. Maybe the Lord is doing the great work through you, but maybe there is only a couple people in your church or in your class. The Lord can be working through you just as much or more as someone who's preaching to 10,000 every Sunday. I mean, I believe there are pastors that have 10 people in their church and God's working through them a lot more than some some of these guys that's got 10,000 in their church. It doesn't matter how many people see it. God still did a great miracle. So Elijah and Elisha go over on dry ground. It wasn't even muddy. It was dry. They didn't get their sandals dirty even. In 2 Kings 2, 9, it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. This is a good request. He wants to do even more for the Lord than his mentor did. It should be your desire to want your student to know twice as much Bible as you do. It should be your desire for him to win twice as many souls as you have. Don't think of it as him outdoing you. Well, you know, what would he have been without your guidance anyway? So it's like all the things he does, you're kind of getting a little bit of the rewards for it as well, probably. Now, verse 10. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. So if Elisha sees Elijah get taken up, then he's going to get a double portion. But if not, then he's not going to get the double portion. This means Elisha is going to have to have his mind stayed on Elijah being taken up. He can't leave Elijah's side. He's going to have to stay spiritually minded with his affection off of the things of this world and Colossians 3, 2 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So if he's going to get this double portion, he's going to have to stay, in a sense, heavenly minded, waiting for Elijah to be taken up. That's what we need to be doing. Stay heavenly minded, setting our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Second Kings 2, 11, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now notice it says it came to pass as they still went on and talked. Elijah was soaking up everything that he could from Elijah before it was too late. There's nothing wrong with the teacher or the pastor or the preacher or just some person who's been a Christian for many years getting with a man one-on-one -on -one and having a bond and friendship, and he can pass down everything that he knows to that person. You see, a lot of times the preacher doesn't believe in having close friendships with individuals, but Elijah did. In Second Kings 2.11, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So this chariot of fire is amazing. Much better, much faster, more durable than any transportation made by man. I'm sure it had heated seats. I'm sure that it had, it didn't even need navigation. It just went where it was going to go. Much You didn't even have to tell it where it was going. It already knew more than you did about where you needed to go. Much better than a Tesla. Uh, man thinks he's good at transportation, making transportation and communication. And Daniel 12, 4, it even says, and uh, you know, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You know, people's going to get around pretty good in the end, but God has better transportation and communication back in the Old Testament than we do in this day. You see, I can talk to God in my mind, and He hears me instantly. I didn't have to set up a cell phone account to do that. I didn't have to get a plan. I don't run out of minutes. Uh, God's transportation for Elijah 
is much better than any limo or taxi that could come pick you up. All these big dogs in the Old Testament had these iron chariots. You know, you've read about that. God has chariots of fire. Do you think he's worried about their iron chariots? I mean, in the Old Testament, men would put their trust in horses. But God has horses of fire. And I'm going to have a white horse of fire at the second coming. When I come back on that white horse, maybe it's one of those horses of fire. These are supernatural horses. So there is animal life in the third heaven. In 2 Kings 2.12, And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in, rent them in two pieces. So Elijah rinsed them in two. And this shows mourning and stuff. And probably he rent them in two because he was just parted asunder from his mentor in the Lord. And it says in verse 13, And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. So Elijah left his mantle. So what are you going to leave behind? A good motivation of me putting out as many studies as I can is so that I can leave something behind. There are a lot of books and studies that I listen to by men who died long ago they left something behind. And I can soak up and get it in my mind and in my Bible, the things that they said. A lot of pastors today won't put it, put their stuff out there for the people to listen to. They say it's only for their church. And I mean, that's, that's fine if that's what they want to do, but I personally don't get that. I understand there are different local churches spread out all over the world, but we are all a part of the same church. So you, what you're saying is you got all this good stuff at your church, and you believe it's good stuff, right? But you're going to leave other parts of the body out that would listen to it if you did put it out there. Or they won't put it out for free. And I understand why some people have to charge and all that, but something I can't understand is my opinion. Everybody can do what they want to do. It's their stuff. They have every right to do what they want to do, but I see a lot of people with their stuff, they have the prices jacked up so high that a person has to work a full day, give a full day's wage almost just to listen to it. I mean, I've bought study Bibles and digital downloads and Bible studies that were extremely expensive. I've, I've, bought, a, I've bought a proverb study that was 50 bucks for 50 something hours. It was a 50-hour study, and it was like 50 bucks. And it was just a digital download, an MP3. I mean, I work a full-time job, and I wait until my birthday to get stuff like that. It's so high. I mean, I, I, mean, I love the Bible. I love Bible studies. But when a person has a family, it can be hard to spend that much money on a digital copy of something that you don't even get a physical copy of. It just, I don't know, that just doesn't sit right with me. But that's, if that's how they want to do it, that's how they do it. It's their stuff. But what are you leaving behind? I want to leave behind a lot of stuff. And I want to leave it behind for free. That way anybody can have access to it. And for, for one thing, I don't believe anyone would buy my stuff anyway. I mean, it's obviously not as good as those guys. I mean, I can understand why they would want to buy those guys' stuff. But at the same time, you know, why are we doing this? What's my motive? It doesn't cost me anything to make these studies other than a massive amount of time. And don't ever let these guys make you think you need a bunch of money to do something for the Lord. That's what you get. That's what they, they kind of lead you to believe is they can't do anything unless they have a bunch of money to do it. And you don't need a bunch of money to do it. Elijah left something behind. Elijah picks up his mantle. And imagine if your pastor left you his Bible that he used his whole ministry. You talk about being excited. I'd go through that thing and copy down everything he had in it into mine. Leave behind a marked up Bible. 
In 2 Kings 2.14, it says, And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So you're going to see that Elijah does get a double portion of what Elijah had, and he's going to do twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Elijah left behind a pattern. And since he did that, Elijah knew how to part the waters because he saw Elijah part the waters. You see, I know how to rightly divide and read the Bible and study the Bible and everything because God used men to leave those things behind and show me. In 2 Kings 2.15, it says, And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now, he's probably thinking, well, where were you when I just, was just starting out? Now you're coming to bow down before me? You know, it's funny. A lot of people won't have anything to do with you when you're trying to go somewhere in your life. They wait until you get where you're trying to go before they say anything to you. It says in Second Kings 2.16, And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men, let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. So these guys are wanting to go look for Elijah. Most likely when he got raptured out, they are they they were already thinking about going, you know, where's he at? Did he really get took to the third heaven? You know, where did they take him? And most likely when we get raptured out, they're going to be looking for us. They went all over looking for Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry here recently. But what if they're, you know, what if they go looking for us when we go missing? When the, when the rapture happens, they're not going to be able to find us anywhere. You know, they have these huge search parties where they look for days, and they look so hard for those two people that they found other people's bodies that were missing. You know, it, the, when the rapture happens, I believe it's going to be all in the crime shows. It will be on the news, trending on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and TikTok. They will say it was an alien invasion, or maybe Trump is hiding everybody underground. You know, stuff like that. But Elijah tells these men, no, don't go look for him. You're not going to find him anyway. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men, and they sought three days, but found him not. So they kept on with Elijah until he says, Okay, okay, go ahead and look for him. But there's no results. They probably found a bunch of dead bodies or stuff that were missing. But Elijah was gone without a trace. John Walsh couldn't find him. Joe Kinda couldn't find him. That wicked woman, Sylvia Brown, couldn't tell them where he was. He was gone, and the only thing he left was his mantle, and Elijah had it. Verse 18, And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? See, all those guys thought they knew better than Elijah. He's like, I told you it would be a waste of time. But now you're about to see another miracle that Elijah did. And Elijah is a picture of Jesus Christ to also does miraculous things with water. He walked on the water. He calmed the storm. He turned the water to wine. In 2 Kings 2, 19 through 21, it says, And the men of the city said unto Elijah, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruse, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth into the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So put some salt in the water. That's what Elijah did. When you put out the word of God, you can use a little salt. You can get a little rough and have grace at the same time. Let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elijah, which he spake. So just like Elijah shows up and heals a land of death, one day Jesus Christ will show up and heal a land of death at the second coming. He's going to fix things. And remember that Elijah will do double the miracles of Elijah. 
It says, And he went up from thence into Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. You know, they're probably saying go up because they knew Elijah went up. And they're calling him bald head. And you'll notice that if someone can't find anything to say about your conduct, they will jump on to your appearance or name calling. Sometimes a group of envious people who can't reprove your doctrine will resort to name calling and making fun of your physical features. But they're forgetting that when the Lord walked the earth, it said, you know, in Isaiah, he hath no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. What does the physical appearance matter anyway? The first thing that comes to some people's minds when they see a preacher is his looks. And it's just odd when I hear a man talking about another man's looks. That's just weird to me. Now, when I listen to a preacher, I'm not worried about his face or how big his waist is. I'm thinking about the words that are coming out of his mouth. I'm not even concerned with what he's wearing. If he's got the right Bible and he's preaching the goods, I'm not worried about his wardrobe. I mean, that kind of stuff is what women naturally are into. Hair, nails, clothes, perfume, waist size. I mean, that's fine for them. They're a woman. That's natural for them to, you know, be into that stuff. But a man shouldn't care about that junk. See, all these guys going around talking about how... I've seen them talking about how chubby Robert Breaker is and how they don't like his beard. That's a bit weird that you're that focused on another man's looks. When you're watching somebody preach, why are you that focused on how he looks? And I watched a documentary against dispensationalism, and the guys were so hard, they're so hard up to prove that dispensationalism is wrong, and they don't really have anything to prove it's wrong, that they had to begin making fun of Robert Breaker, a well-known dispensationalist. They had to make fun of his appearance, say he looked like a chipmunk and that he's chubby, and made fun of Gene Kim's haircut a few times. I'm thinking, is this all you got? I mean, what kind of man are you just going around looking at how other men look? I believe the name-calling and making fun of someone's personal appearance is from someone who really doesn't have anything that they can say about you, but they hate you, so they like to sit and pick you out and pick you apart physically. In a sense, they are acting like little children. It's kid stuff. Little kids like to point out the appearance of you and like to do so in public places. Many times they do it innocently even. But with adults, when they do it, they're doing it to humiliate another person. But these little children here in 2 Kings 2 are getting in the way of Elijah. They must have forgot he sit under Elijah, a man who would call down fire from heaven and burn you to Rice Krispies. Notice what he does. 2 Kings 2.24, And he turned back and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. Notice that forty and two children. That's some fierce bears, because there was just two of them. There was just two, two bears, but forty-two children. I mean, that makes me think these were definitely little children, because surely two bears wouldn't you know, get 42, 42 grown men or 42 young men. If you know anything about bear attacks, then you know those things put their mouth on your skull and you can hear your bones popping and cracking and their breath smells like death and fish, they say. When they're gnawing on your head, you, the people say that they smell death and they smell nasty, rotten fish. Talk about a nightmare. I mean, Elijah would call down fire from heaven and have them burn up in a moment. But Elijah calls on two she-bears, two mama bears. And I think the 42, number 42 is significant. Because that number is connected with the end times in Revelation 11.2 and Revelation 13.5. And when that pale horse comes out in Revelation 6, men are killed with sword, hunger, death, and with the beasts of the earth. So lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, as they say, is going to be attacking people. Second Kings 2.25, And he went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. So, that 
is your introduction, your real introduction to Elisha.